Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thanks so much for joining us today for our program, Golden Record Messages from Earth. We are so happy that you're joining us as we celebrate 44 years of this incredible story. I'm so excited to share it with you today. It's definitely one of my favorites. Welcome, though. My name's Alicia. I'm the lead teaching artist at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City. I'll be your host today for this program. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free. But if you'd like to support us in delivering this exciting content, please do click on the link in the comments or in the description. So feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And of course, if you've got any questions, you can put them there too. Now, everyone, today we are going to talk about things like music and art in space. Now, I know you might be thinking, okay, hold on a second. I thought space was microgravity. There's no air. You know, if there's no air, that means the sound waves can't travel, which means, of course, there can't be sound, right? So how can there be music in space if no one can hear you scream, right? Well, fair enough. Uh, before we do get to the music part, uh, I do want to first say, you know, okay, yeah, you might be wondering, wait, you're from the Intrepid Museum. Why are you guys talking about space? I thought you were that ship with airplanes, right? So let's do our quick recap. For those of you who may not be familiar, of course, this is the Intrepid Museum. So we are located in a historic World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. It was constructed back in 1943 and served in three wars, World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. And then later on in 1982, they converted it to what it is now, the place that we all know and love, the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum, which is docked right off of uh, the shoreline of Manhattan in the Hudson River. But there it is again, right? There's that word space, sea, air, and space museum. Why are we a space museum? Well, some of you out there in the chat might happen to know, but I'll do a little quick recap for you. We are, of course, a sea museum because we are a naval ship. In fact, here on the right is one of the propellers from our ship. We had four at one point. Uh, they were all on the Intrepid, and they helped to push it through the water, as you can see with this aircraft carrier picture here. Now, of course, we are also an air museum because we carried, we launched, and we landed and currently have on display quite a number of airplanes and helicopters. So really, you could say we are just like a floating airport, right? So this is the Avenger here on the left, by the way, the oldest airplane that we've got on display from World War II. And then also on the right, we have the Fury, which was a jet plane that was used during the Cold War. But everyone... Why are we a space museum? Well, take a look at this. So does anyone out there in the chat happen to know, tell me if you do, what do we call this vehicle here? So see, during the Cold War, all right, we were in a race. We were in a space race with the Soviet Union. And of course, every race has a finish line, right? So the finish line of that race was to be the first country to safely land a man all the way on the moon and return him back home again. But of course, there were a number of smaller steps that we had to take before we could go make that giant leap on the moon. A lot of baby steps, as we say. So this is right here, part of one of those smaller steps. And it also has to do, of course, why we are a space museum. And I see, frankly, Elle in the chat got it. Yes, this, everyone, is a vehicle called a space capsule. And yes, more specifically, a Mercury capsule. Excellent. Now, these are what we used our, uh, for our earliest missions going into space, even before we got to go all the way to the moon. Uh, before all of that, we first had to just figure out how to launch, right? How to get off the ground, pull away from our gravitational pull here. How to then, once we get up into space, breathe, how to also eat and sleep and work over long periods of time, uh, and then eventually how to do things like dock with other spacecraft and also land, of course, on the moon, uh, and all of that before then we could go bouncing around on the moon. And we did talk a lot about those things in some of our other programs. But capsules like these were part of some of those early steps, as I mentioned. And of course, once they went up, they had to come back down again. So everyone, these capsules landed in the ocean. Uh, 
they figured, yeah, the water would be a nice, you know, somewhat softer landing place than on land, you know, in a desert or on a mountain or something or on someone's house. So they would be out there floating in the middle of the ocean. On the left here, you can see uh, an Apollo capsule landing in the water. And then also on the right, we've got one of those earlier missions as well. There's, uh, I believe, Scott Carpenter being picked up from the ocean there. Uh, and so everyone, they would go and rescue these astronauts, of course, in a helicopter and also retrieve their space capsules. And so on two very, very special occasions, the Intrepid actually got to be what they call the prime recovery vessel. They got to go and pick up these space capsules and uh, their astronauts inside. So imagine, right? How do you think they felt to be part of such an important mission like that? Being part of this idea of going into space and coming back home, right? So here, everyone, are actually two pictures from Retrieval. On the left, you can even see uh, right on the side there, we've got the Intrepid itself with all of those sailors looking on so excited. And yeah, I would be pretty excited too. We've actually got some postcards and things like that from our collections uh, that were actually just printed for the occasion. And lots of sailors definitely wrote home to their loved ones saying, whoa, guess what just happened today? This was such a really cool thing. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is why we are a space museum. The Intrepid played a very important role in picking up astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space. Now, to get onto this whole idea of outer space and this Voyager thing, maybe you're not familiar with Voyager or those golden records that you tuned in for. Well, I'm going to start off by giving us just kind of a little recap of where we are in the universe, all right? So believe it or not, for about 100 years, Earth has actually been sending a lot more out into space than just these capsules and astronauts that we just talked about. But it's not necessarily what you might think. Now, we have been sending out our radio and our television signals, so things like sounds and pictures and voices, even music, out into space for decades, as far back as really the early 1900s. Every TV show, every song that you've ever heard on the radio, it's all out there, just waiting to be picked up by someone. And currently, those signals are about 110 light years away from Earth. Now, what does that mean? Light years, right? So light years are how we measure distance in space. It's the distance that light can travel in one Earth year. So a concept, obviously, that we as humans here on Earth have made up. But to get even more specific, everyone, let's talk about the sun, all right? So it takes the light of the sun about eight Earth minutes to reach us here on Earth because of where we're located in relation to it in the solar system. So the light that if you look outside, you know, thankfully today it's a bright sunny day. Yesterday it's a little gross, but today we got this bright sunny day outside. The light that we see out our window, it is actually from eight minutes ago. So that means theoretically, if the sun were to burn out right now, right this second, we actually wouldn't even know for eight whole minutes. Kind of weird. And for comparison, though, it actually takes five and a half hours for the light of the sun to get all the way out to Pluto. So much, much further away, it takes a lot longer for uh, that light to be relayed. So if we here on Earth are eight light minutes from the sun, how far away is one light year? All right. So I'll show you. This is what about one light year would look like. All right. So it is way outside of our solar system, about six trillion miles away. And from that distance, our sun is just a dot, right? It's just like any other star in the universe. One light year away is much farther than, let's say, the moon, getting to the moon, right? That was a while, but much further than that. It's even much further than the edge of our own solar system. And of course, it is much, much further than any human or any man-made machine has ever even traveled out into space. And now if you think about it, our broadcasts have gone a hundred times that. Whoa. <laughs> so what does 100 light years away look like? Well, kind of like this. <laughs> More space, right? From 100 light years away, you are way, way out there in space. You actually probably would not even see our sun because it would be so far away. But of course, you'd see plenty of other stars. The sun, of course, is a star. Uh, now, you know, I know it's really hard to imagine how far broadcasts have traveled, but I might be able to illustrate it in kind of the perspective of our own home galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. 
So everyone, I want you to take a look at this here. And I want you to imagine that you on earth um, are inside of this blue dot, all right? So uh, we are inside of this bubble that is 200 light years in diameter, all right? Now that means that we are at the very center and our broadcasts have traveled out 100 light years on either direction of us, all right? So that bubble is that 100 light year kind of, you know, that, that bubble going all around us on either, all the directions, all right? So everyone, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger for you. I want you to keep your eye on that blue dot until you can't see it anymore. And I'm just gonna keep zooming out till we can't even see it, all right? So here we go. So keep your eye on it. You've also got that arrow to help you out. You can hopefully still see that blue dot there. It's pretty bright, all right? There we go, going even further. It's getting definitely smaller. You're seeing it now just as that little tiny bubble in perspective of everything else. We go even further. So now maybe you're starting to recognize some of the, the outer bands here of our Milky Way galaxy. You can still kind of see that little pixel there. Keep going, all right. We're still going. Now it's getting really hard to see. It's really kind of starting to blend in with all of those other stars and things there. We're gonna keep going. Oh, still going, but that arrow is helping us out at least. So we're still looking around there. Still, you know, really, really difficult though. And this everyone is the full picture all right, of what our Milky Way galaxy looks like. So can you still see that blue dot? I don't know. <laughs> it might be a little bit difficult. So take my word for it there. It is still there though. But everyone, if that doesn't make you feel small, I mean, I don't know what will. So there, everyone, we are looking at now the Milky Way galaxy and you can barely see that dot. So while 100 light years away does seem like a super, super far distance from here on Earth, and don't get me wrong, it absolutely is. Again, from 100 light years, you wouldn't even really see our sun. It still, though, is only a very tiny fraction of our universe, let alone our own galaxy here, right? It's just one itty bitty little pixel uh, within that Milky Way, let alone everything else beyond that. So everyone, I want to ask a question of you, all right? What if there is life out there? All right, so what if, you know, these TV shows and these songs that we're sending out, they're actually making contact with distant civilizations, right? So theoretically, any intelligent life within that blue bubble or eventually beyond it could tune in and listen to our programming for better or worse, right? But the signals do kind of thin out the further they go. So we're not actually sure how clear the transmission would necessarily be. And, eh, you know, again, do we really want some alien life form's first impression of us to be something like a reality show or, you know, even like a cartoon with talking cars for that matter? Does that really represent who we are here on Earth? So if we were trying to contact distant life, and if you really want to have your message heard, you know, you're probably going to need to write it down or record it even or send it out just a bit more intentionally out into the stars. And so in a roundabout way, that's kind of what led us to the Voyager Golden Record, which is this super cool thing that I am going to talk to you about today. Now, what is Voyager? Well, in case you weren't familiar, this week in 1977, so 44 years ago, NASA sent two spacecrafts, two probes called Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 out into the universe to explore the distant galaxy. So they were each a piece of machinery, you know, antennas and electronics that were launched to help to gain a better understanding of our solar system. Now, the timing of these launches, though, were very, very specific because they lined up with a once-in-a-lifetime alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that only occurred every 176 years. And that actually would allow us to gather a lot more close-range data and images from those distant planets, and specifically Jupiter and Saturn to start, before then reaching interstellar space outside our solar system. So the layout of those four planets that you can actually see here, uh, that meant that they'd be able to use less fuel. They could take less time because they would be putting a spacecraft along a path that would actually be able to swing them from one planet to the next on its own. Now, what does that mean? Well, because of this gravitational pull of each planet, you know, every planet has a pull, just like Earth has a pull that keeps the moon around it. The sun has a pull that keeps all the planets around it, right? Each of these planets um, have this pull and the Voyager probes were able to get this gravity assist. It's basically a flyby of each planet. It bend the spacecraft's 
flight path and increase its velocity, so its speed, just enough to keep it moving along its path. So the primary missions were, of course, to explore Jupiter and Saturn, specifically things like studying active volcanoes, Jupiter's moon Io, and uh, taking a closer look, of course, at Saturn's rings. Well, the first two spacecraft were built to uh, last just five years, so that would be long enough to just make it past Saturn at their furthest point. And again, they really were just kind of, you know, supposed to be five years, just make it to the early 80s, all right? So what did we discover? Well, the Voyagers taught us, first of all, that Jupiter's red spot is actually, many of you probably know this, a raging cyclone, uh, and there's lightning there too. They showed us some uh, close-up views of its moon, Europa, that also suggested to us that it's covered in an icy crust over liquid water, so something very, very interesting as we look for life on other planets and moons. We also saw uh, active volcanoes on another one of its moons, Io, as well. And then as it flew by Saturn, we discovered three more moons of Saturn. There's so many of them. We also saw a thick Earth-like atmosphere around another one of its moons, Titan, another one that's uh, on our list of looking for life, and learn more about, of course, its beautiful rings. But as the years went on, and they were able to successfully achieve all of these goals and objectives with Jupiter and Saturn, they realized the spacecraft's doing just fine. It's not going anywhere. It's been five years and it's still quite alive. And so they were able to expand even further on their goals. They figured, all right, it's still going. What else can we explore? So they used remote control programming. They altered the mission slightly to then also include exploration of Uranus and Neptune for Voyager 2. So uh, about 10 years after its launch and about five years after passing Saturn, remember these are pretty far away, Voyager 2 gave us some close-up views of Uranus and 11 of its moons. We also discovered that it too has a ring, believe it or not, a small one. And we were able to detect temperatures as low as negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, three years after that, it then flew by Neptune, that darker blue one there, and discovered six new moons, rings around Neptune too, they've all got rings, hey, and a huge rotating storm that they then called the Great Dark Spot. So Jupiter's got its red spot, Neptune's got its dark spot, it's all a bunch of storms. Now, shortly after Voyager 2 passed Neptune, scientists decided to turn off its cameras because they realized, well, it's not really going to be flying close enough to anything else to take images. This was very specific along that path. So they did that. But a few months later on Valentine's Day of 1990, uh, Voyager 1 was coming up on the same spot. So right before they turned those cameras off, they, uh, it's now, you know, about 4 billion miles from the sun uh, and moving still, but they decided to turn it around and to take its last series of images, which is a 60 frame mosaic, which has now been dubbed the solar system family portrait. So take a look at this, everyone. I'll make this a little bigger for you. All right, so this is the only series of images that captures Venus, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all arrayed about the sun. Now, this is also the portrait of Earth that you can see there on the, the bottom there that inspired Carl Sagan, the astrophysicist, to think about really the fragility and the uniqueness of our home planet. And he said it was a tiny speck, of, uh, a tiny speck in a beam of scattered sunlight, a pale blue dot. And it really is, just like I was showing you that little blue dot uh, before. Well, Earth, you know, that's really what it is. It's very tiny in the whole universe. Now, honestly... Besides these incredible pictures, what's amazing is that both of those spacecraft's lifetimes have now stretched on from, again, a lifespan of just five years to now 44 years. And it's still going. They're both still going. And between Voyager 1 and 2, we now have explored all of our outer planets of the solar system, 48 of their moons, and all of those unique rings and magnetic fields of those planets as well. We've also, in the process, uh, resolved a number of questions. We've raised a number of other interesting questions about the origins and the evolutions of our solar system. Uh, but as of 2018, just a few years ago, both Voyagers have now entered interstellar space outside of our solar system. So beyond something called the heliosphere, which is this protective bubble of particles and magnetic fields uh, that's created by the sun. And they're still going. <laughs> they're flying at 35,000 miles an hour in different directions, uh, billions and billions of miles from Earth. They're still sending us back data. And they're just going to keep doing this until they run out of power. 
So really, really kind of, you know, fascinating that we have sent this man-made thing out there. We're still learning more. We are now outside of our solar system, still exploring. So everyone, I want to pause here before moving on and talking more specifically about those records and see if we've got any questions. Any questions? How long did it take the Voyagers to get to Jupiter and Saturn? So it took them about two years to get to Jupiter. So again, it launched in 77. It got there about 1979. Uh, and then about three years to get to Saturn. So that was about 80, 81. Um, and the visits to Jupiter were about um, four months apart. So between uh, one and two. And then about nine months apart for Saturn. So as it got out, it was moving, you know, slightly different speeds. Um, but then Voyager 2 actually kept going. So it ultimately was about nine years from when it launched to get to Uranus, and then about 12 years to get to Neptune. So again, they're really, really far away. Um, and things to keep in mind, of course, if we ever do decide to go exploring, you know, looking for another place to live, let's say somewhere else in the solar system, um, if it's a moon or a planet or whatever it ends up being, it's going to take us a long time to get there still. So. Things are far. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Uh, are the Voyager spacecraft the first to leave the solar system? Actually, no, they're not. Uh, so the Voyager spacecraft are uh, the third and fourth human spacecraft to fly beyond all of our planets and uh, you know leave the heliosphere. Um, about five years before the Voyager launches, the early 70s, we sent up Pioneers 10 and 11. Um, Pioneer 10 did uh, flybys of the four outer planets, um, left the solar system in the early 80s, I think it was 83. Um, and then Pioneer 11, also was meant to look at Jupiter and Saturn, um, and it went interstellar in 1990. But because of the speed of Voyager 1, uh, it actually passed Pioneer 10 uh, in 1998 to be the most distant human-made object in space. And it certainly is now as well, because it's still just going unless it's, you know, unless it runs into something else, it's just going to keep going. <laughs> All right, everyone. So we covered the Voyager missions, but what about this golden record thing, right? So scientists knew that they were planning to send out these spacecraft on a one-way trip. And they realized, all right, they're never coming back. So why not attach a note from Earth? So you can kind of think of it like a message in a bottle, all right? Maybe they write this message and they just throw it out into the cosmic ocean, just waiting to be picked up. And uh, who knows, maybe even responded to someday by a distant civilization. So this message, uh, a time capsule, really, they recorded on a 12-inch golden record. Now, before I go on, everyone, I know some of you out there might not know what a record is. Ugh, aging myself. But let me explain, everyone. Let's go back together. Before Spotify, before MP3s, we had these compact discs, all right, or CDs. These are round pieces of kind of shiny plastic. Um, they held an album, all right, usually about an hour of music or so on them. Uh, they also, you know, they were thin. They also made good Frisbees or coasters if you needed one. Before we had CDs, though, we had these things called cassette tapes, all right? So these had magnetized ribbon in them that wound from spool to spool, uh, you can see there's two little spools on each of them to play music. Um, many of us have maybe some not so fond memories of needing to wind them back up again with a pencil after your tape player decided to eat it and crumple it all up there. Uh, but then everyone before that, we had these things called eight tracks. Now, admittedly, these were a little before my time, but uh, apparently they were very similar to cassettes, only a little shorter. They held about eight tracks of music. Makes sense for the name. And then even before that, everyone, we had records. Okay, now records are still actually around today. Um, you can certainly still buy them. They are kind of a novelty thing for also for people who really love music. Apparently, the quality of the record, I've been told, is much better than any um, you know recording that you'd have on you know, an MP3 or something like that even. Um, but you are also equally as likely to see one of their players in a museum, uh, often referred to as a phonograph or a gramophone, even the earlier ones. So the earliest phonograph, everyone, um, was made by this guy in 1877. This is Thomas Edison, a very young Thomas Edison. And uh, maybe you've heard of him. It used wax cylinders instead of discs. So you can imagine kind of like a tin can made out of wax, but with music carved into it. Uh, and it later blew up, though, with a very similar invention called the gramophone. 
Now, gramophones used flat discs. This is, you know, a very early version of what we might see today with DJs, right? On both of them, the music could be played by using a stylus or a needle, which moved over the very fine grooves in the record and vibrated at a very specific acoustic frequency as the record was spinning around on a flat turntable. Again, similar to what DJs use today. Uh, now, this was by and large the main format for sound recordings for many decades to come, and it is also the medium that they chose in 1977 to record our messages from Earth. So, they actually mounted these records and a record player on the side of the two Voyager spacecraft, and right now the records are about 13 billion miles from home. And in just five to 10 years, by about 2030, they're estimating, both Voyager 1 and 2 will be so far out into the universe, they will actually not even be able to communicate with us anymore. But like I said, they're not going to stop moving. The cameras are off. We're not going to be able to see what they see anymore, uh, but they are just going to keep sailing out further and further into space forever or until they crash into something that gets in their way or maybe someone comes and picks it up. Who knows? Now, again, everyone, we have no idea if there is any life out there in the universe, but considering how we think life sprung up here on Earth, it is safe to assume that yeah, we probably aren't alone in the entirety of the cosmos. But that said, it's also safe to say that whoever is out there probably doesn't look or sound or think or read the way that we do, right? So even if distant life forms did find this spacecraft and did find this record, how would they even know what it is, right? Or what it represented or even how to use it? I mean, I bet many of you out there probably don't even know how to use a record too, but that is A-OK, -okay, everyone. So let me ask you this question. How do you write a message for someone that is intended, uh, you know, for a people that you don't know or who are in the distant future? What if they can't see or heal or hear or uh, feel or taste or smell like we do or even at all? What language would you even write it in? Now, you would, of course, want things to be as clear and as easy as possible to understand, but you also have a limited amount of space or words or pictures to do it in. So NASA had to invent a whole new system of communication, a code, really, that in theory could be deciphered by anyone anywhere in the universe to teach someone how to actually play this record if they found it, which is no small feat. And then they put the instructions of how to do it on this album cover, so to speak. All right. Now, but don't forget, right, here on Earth, we have systems that we develop, these Earth units of measurements for everything from length, right, distance uh, to time. Everything, including RPM, revolutions per minute, right, which is how you play a record, by the way, uh, is something that was entirely devised by a human. A minute is a, a, a human-made concept. So they decided to start off this new language with a building block of the universe instead. Hydrogen, one proton and one electron. They thought that any spacefaring civilization would probably understand the properties of hydrogen, the most commonly known element in the universe, enough to know what, maybe, this diagram meant. Now, this can be found, everyone, in the bottom right corner of the album cover, and it illustrates the uh, transition of the spin movements of the two lowest states of hydrogen, again, the proton and the electron. Now, that is what is shown in these blue circles here. You can kind of see the spin rotations. On the left, that line has a little dot on the bottom, and on the right, the line has the dot on the top. Now, when this happens, the electromagnetic magnetic radiation that is released, uh, it happens for a period of about 0.7 nanoseconds, and that is theoretically designated by this tick mark right here in the center. So it is hoped that aliens would equate that tick mark with this transition time unit of measurement, and then from there could figure out the rest of the diagrams on the cover. All right, so if you're with me so far, hold on tight because it's still going. Now on the image to the left of that, all right, is meant to show where we live. We are right in the middle of that starburst, which has been specifically designed with distance in mind. The direction and the proportional length of all of those lines show where distant collapsed stars are. They give off 
pulses of radiation, pulsars is what they're called, uh, with the period of each pulse denoted next to each line. All right, so theoretically, if aliens are able to make that connection, they could possibly match the periods of time with the correct pulsars, all right, in real time, triangulate our position, and then come say hello. Simple, right? Now, how does this all relate to sounds or music, right? Well, remember, this is, of course, a record, and there is actually a record player included on the craft with the needle already in place, ready to go. So the pictures on the top left show the proper placement and elevation of the stylus, that needle on the record, and the markings around it are the speed that you would need to turn the record to get to play it correctly. So translate it again with all those little dashes there. Based on the unit of measurement I described earlier with the hydrogen, the top image shows about 3.6 seconds per rotation. That's about 16 and two thirds RPM. And at that speed, you would begin to hear what's recorded on the record at the proper pace. And then on the bottom image, we can also translate that the entire playing time of the record is 3,229 seconds or roughly about 54 minutes. So let's imagine everyone, we are some distant civilization. All right, let's imagine we've got eyes that can perceive this thing, we can see it, uh, that we are advanced enough to understand what hydrogen is and how it works and all these spin movements. And we are able to somehow figure this thing out. What would we hear? Well, I will ask you, what would you put on a record that is meant to represent the whole of the human species at this moment in time? What message would you want to send? So creating this record, everyone, was an opportunity for humankind to reflect on itself, really, and for us to think about ourselves as one unified species. Scientists knew that it would be very possible that this record may never be played during its billion year journey, but creating it in itself, creating it together just really reminded everyone of who we are and where we came from. And it's really wild to think that someday, billions of years from now, that record may be the only remaining evidence of humanity. Wow. So the first message that we wanted to send was about peace and working together with the goal of improving the lives of everyone here on planet Earth. So the very first sound on the golden record that I'll play for you now is the voice of the United Nations Secretary General, Kurt Waldheim, who says the following, and hopefully you all will be able to hear this. Here we go. As the, sec Oops. Try it one more time. As the Secretary General of the United Nations, an organization of 147 member states who represent almost all of the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. We step out of our solar system into the universe, seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon to be taught if we are fortunate. We know full well that our planet and all its inhabitants are but a small part of this immense universe that surrounds us. And it is with humility and hope that we take this step. But of course, everyone, English is not the only language spoken here on Earth. So they also included greetings in 55 different languages, beginning with Akkadian, which was spoken in Mesopotamia about 6,000 years ago, and ending with Wu, which is a modern Chinese dialect. They felt it was really important that Voyager greet the universe as a representative of one Earth community, albeit a complex one of many different parts. And now the story behind the creation of this part of the interstellar message was later described by Carl Sagan, again, who was in charge of the project. And he said that due to the limited amount of time that they had, many of the speakers were from the communities surrounding Cornell University, where he worked, uh, as well as, you know, just kind of the areas there. Um, and the speakers, you know, weren't given really any instructions on what to say other than that it had to be a greeting to possible extraterrestrials and that it had to be brief. That's it. So, you know, think about it. What would you say? <laughs> Here is a random sampling of what some people ended up deciding on. Adonish Lushulmu. Taikong Ben Yu. Nin Ho. Nin Jia Babe. Uyengalai Unja Deo. 
تحياتنا للأصدقاء في النجوم يا ليت يجمعنا الزمان نمشكار بشي شانتي هوك هارتلك أخوتا عن إدرين Hello from the children of planet Earth Bonjour tout le monde Shalom Tanti auguri e saluti Konnichiwa Ogenki deska? Pritvi basi haruvata santi maya bhavishya ko subhakamna. Želimo vam sve najlepše sa naše planete. Sanadaka. But remember everyone, the sounds of Earth are more than just what we say to each other. Humans, of course, are uniquely alive here on planet Earth, and we have no idea if any other civilization out there knows what commonplace things like oceans or birds or thunder or whales sound like, right? We take for granted the sounds of crickets and laughter and heartbeats and, you know, honking horns outside our windows, but it's very likely that alien life has never before heard these sounds. So we decided to include a few of those on there too. So here are just a few that are included on the record. And as I play this for you, see how many you can recognize. And then, of course, everyone, because it is a record, as promised, they also had music. Now, the scientists provided music samples from around the world, both Eastern and Western classics from a variety of eras and cultures, uh, things like Beethoven and Bach and Mozart, but also things like Aborigine songs from Australia and panpipes and drums from Peru and bagpipes from Azerbaijan, a Navajo chant, and even some good old rock and roll. I saw somebody mention that in the chat too. Johnny, be good. So here are a few snippets from that playlist as well. Let's try that one more time. All right, friends. Well, it seems like it keeps getting stuck at that one for some reason. I apologize for that. But a bunch of those things were played. Um, and all right, so there we go. Um, but I will tell you, actually, one of the songs that I ended up not playing for you uh, was Johnny Be Good <laughs> because of rights issues. Um, but I will tell you, there was actually an episode of Saturday Night Live in 1978 where Steve Martin played a psychic. And he says, the extraterrestrials have found the record. And after all of this time, they have sent us a message back. Send more Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, of course, being the writer of the song Johnny Be Good. Uh, but everyone on the other side of the record were also pictures, 115 of them, actually. But remember, this was not uh, a digital disc, right? There were no JPEGs or anything like that. It was all audio. So the pictures were actually encoded within the audio waveforms themselves. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. And we're really relying on them having some sort of visual perception to be able to figure this out. So 
This, everyone, up on the top right is the last symbols on the album cover to explain how to use these images so how they can actually see them. Now, this uh, in the blue square here on the top right, it shows how the waveform data is broken up with each section taking 0 0.008 seconds to play. And again, underneath it, you can see that that unit of time measurement, so that is uh, 0 0.008 seconds is on there too. So let's hope that they get that far. Now the symbol below it shows that each of those sections of data completes about um, one out of 512 scan lines that make up the complete image of a television set. So to understand that, you kind of have to understand how an old cathode ray TV worked. Again, this is 1977, this old 70s technology. But you can kind of think of it like the blinds in a window, right? Or a woven blanket, um, you know, where each of the strips kind of put together makes a larger picture, kind of like a mosaic. And then within each of those strips, if you were to code the decibel levels to show either lighter or darker, you'd actually be able to draw out the image. It really is kind of mind blowing how that one worked. And it did work. Uh, now, the first image, of course, if you were to put all that together and get it correct, would be this. This is the calibration circle. It's the last image that we see here on the album cover to explain, and it's underneath it all. So if they can somehow figure it all out and decode a shape that looks like that picture they'll know that they're onto something and they can keep going. Then if they do, and all goes according to plan, here are some of the other 115 images that they would see. So again, there's your calibration circle telling you you're doing it right. Then you've got the location of Earth again on the left here based on those pulsars, another image on the cover that we talked about. So again, telling them they're doing it right. But now it's positioned next to a picture of Andromeda, our closest neighboring galaxy. So another helpful tip there for them to find a bait on some visual cues. Uh, then there's also mathematical definitions based on that hydrogen language again, um, as well as other physical units. There are pictures of our planets in the solar system, just like Earth and Jupiter we've got here. There's also things like DNA bases and images of cell division. We've got human anatomy and conception, the growth cycle of a human, uh, images of human relationships, and then also geographic information about things like continental drift patterns. Uh, on the right here, actually, it's kind of interesting. We've got um, what the Earth was looking like many years ago in the past. In the center where the hand is, it's what it looks like today. And then on the bottom, it's what it's predicted to look like in the future. So some slightly different uh, shapes there. Then you've also got images of land masses and geography structures like shorelines and sand dunes and architecture and terrain. Uh, things like vegetation and insects and fish and animals. You've got images of people doing things, so athletes and scientists and astronauts and uh, pictures of children learning, although this one always kind of makes me laugh because we've got all these pictures, you know, of Earth and here we are living on Earth, come find us. And maybe they come find us and then they see this picture of all these massive children on top of the planet Earth and they might be very confused about the scale of the human body. <laughs> but anyway, they've also got pictures of people eating, uh, cooking, drinking. And then people building things, building structures, building machines, also technology. You've got a picture of an x-ray machine there, again, with our bones. Interesting. Uh, and travel. There's a picture of a rocket. So you name it. Uh, they've got all of these different things, but they also very consciously chose not to include images of things like war or poverty or disease or any specific religions or ideologies because they, again, really wanted to hammer home that we are all one global community, uh, but again, one of many complex smaller parts. So my friends, uh, that is Voyager and its golden record. Uh, there is clearly a lot for them to figure out on that cover. I mean, you know, just looking at it now, you probably forgot half of what I said. And again, it might be very presumptive because if they can't even see or hear the way that we do, none of this is really going to matter to them anyway. They won't be able to see the pictures or hear the sounds. But you also have to think too, well, all right, what if distant life forms are so big that this record is really just the size of a grain of sand for them, right? And they don't even notice it. Or alternatively, uh, you know, maybe they think it's an enemy coming to attack them. Maybe the color gold is very offensive to them. And so maybe they just go and blow it up. Or maybe they like to eat gold. And so they, uh, you know, want to eat it instead. <laughs> or, you know, you could even go the other direction and think, wow, 
what if the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs was actually another Earth sending us their version of a Voyager golden record? I guess a giant Voyager golden rock or something. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> who knows? The, the thought experiments are just endless out there. But again, none of this was really the point of this project. Uh, one of the other messages on the record was a message from the then president of the United States, Jimmy Carter. And in his statement, he said the following. I'll make it real big for you here. He said, this is a present from a small, distant world. We are attempting to survive our time so that we may live into yours. We hope someday, having solved the problems we faith, face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. This record represents our hope our determination, and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. And that, everyone, was what it was actually all about. Now, I know I just threw a ton at you. So before we move on to our quick activity at the end here, I do want to pause again and see if we've got any other questions. So any other questions? Uh, what's the record made out of? Sure. So the record itself is made out of gold-plated copper. Uh, it's 12 inches in diameter. And uh, the record's cover, so the thing, again, that has all the symbols and everything on it, is actually made out of aluminum. And it's got a sample of uranium on it. So the idea is that if a distant civilization uh, encounters this record, they might be able to use the ratio of, like, the remaining uranium to the other elements to determine maybe the age of the record. But again, this is assuming so much. Um, but I will say this too, the record has on it a handwritten inscription um, right around the center of it. It says, to, to the makers of music, all worlds, all times. Um, somebody had hand etched it on the surface between the label and the playable surface, um, which was very actually common practice. People used to do that to you know, put their names on their rec records and stuff. It's a cool little touch, but uh, it actually originally got rejected uh, because of that during the project, because that wasn't up to the specified code. You know, that's not what it was supposed to have been done. But Carl Sagan, who was in charge of the project, actually convinced them to keep it as it is, because he's like, no, this is representative of what humans do. They wanted to send an extra little message, and so they went along with it. So it's got that cool inscription, too. Any other questions? How did they pick what was on the record? So the contents of the record were selected by NASA, um, or for NASA, really, by a committee um, that, again, was chaired by Carl Sagan. He was an astronomer and an astrophysicist. Uh, he worked at Cornell University at the time. And it took a, over a year, actually, but, uh, you know, around a year um, to pick everything and to gather it all, all those samples, all those pictures, um, the sounds, the musical selections. And actually, the inclusion of Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good was at the time very controversial. Some people felt that rock music as a whole was too adolescent. It was too teen, right? Um, to which Carl Sagan replied, well, there are a lot of adolescents on the planet. True. Uh, but they also did want to include the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun, very good song, on the record. Uh, and the Beatles were asked. They loved the idea. But sadly, they did not own the copyright to the song, their song. And so the company that did wanted to charge them $50,000 per record for each of the records. There's two. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, the entire Voyager program really was the record project there was just costing like $18,000 to produce. So clearly they could not afford $100,000 to get the rights to the song. That arguably may never get heard, but, uh, you know, it clearly therefore never made it on the record. So aliens will never know who the Beatles were, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. And last question. When will the Voyager probes run out of power? So like I mentioned, everyone, 44 years ago in 1977, we launched these things and they were supposed to last for five years. And amazingly, they are still out there, still trucking along. Uh, you know, they're still sending us back information, which is really wild. Uh, 44 years later, they are expecting the probes to finally run out of juice. And they really are trying to make them last as long as they can. They're, you know, turn, they turn off the cameras. They're turning off little things, little support things here and there to keep it going. But they're expecting them to finally run out of power around. Around 2025. So just a couple more years for us to enjoy that. But again, just because they're out of power, they're still going to keep moving. And those, you know, the, the record is still going to be on it. And so if they can figure out how to just spin that record under that needle, even if there's no juice in it, it'll still play. They'll still figure it out. So who knows? <laughs> they don't have any actual power anymore, but it's still going to be out there far, far away. Now, everyone, uh, the, the, the Voyager record 
in itself was a kind of time capsule, right? So what is a time capsule? Well, remember before we talked about space capsules, right? Those were spaceships that um, the Intrepid picked up, right? They basically were a container for an astronaut or two uh, or three that got launched into space. So a time capsule is similar in that it is also a container, but for the past. So in the case of the Voyager Golden Record, it was a log, really. It was an actual recording. Uh, so a time capsule could be a diary, a scrapbook, uh, or it could be an actual container that you could put objects in so you can remember later or pass them on to other people in the future. Uh, and this one actually is one that was put together by scientists at a lab at MIT in 1957. And they set an open date, as you can see there, for a thousand years in the future, 2957. Can you imagine what the world is going to look like in 2957? Whoa. Whew. Now you can make your own time capsule at home to be revealed later. Again, it has been 44 years since Voyager left Earth, and it still has yet to be found by anyone out there that we know of. But how far in the future, if you made a time capsule, would you want it to be found? A thousand years might be a long time. It does certainly sound like a long time, but you could wait as long as you'd like. You could open yours in 5, 10, 20 50 years, it's up to you. Uh, the longer the better, I think, to see how much you've grown and changed. Uh, and you can create your own time capsule at home by writing about your experiences, photographing them, or creating a scrapbook of you know what you and your family are doing right now. All of our you know wild experiences at home over the past year, for example. Or you can collect some meaningful items that you might have lying around the house. Here's just a couple of ideas that we threw together for you. So, uh, you know, this could be things like um, photos or drawings or small items or keepsakes. Just see what you can find that describes you and what story you want to tell about you or your family today. And you might include things like newspaper clippings from current events, uh, maybe even a length of string to show how tall you are right now. You can compare it to yourself later if you grow. Uh, maybe a list of things that you like right now, your favorite things, your favorite color or food or book or song or movie right now. Um, and then you could also, you know, even write a letter to yourself. Do you have any goals for the futures or hopes? And what about questions you might have about the future? Maybe you could make some predictions of where you'll be when you open this time capsule years from now. What will you be doing? What will your life look like? Now, to do this, many people um, use something like a shoebox or a jar. And some people also like to bury their time capsules in the ground for future generations to dig up. But I will caution you, if you do that, make sure you put it in a very watertight container so that it doesn't fall apart underground. I know we just received a ton of rain here yesterday in New York City. So, you know, think about something like that. Uh, you probably also want to avoid things like food or batteries since you might be storing it for long term. Um, but otherwise, you know, you could also even just store something like this in the back of your closet or in an attic or in a basement. Well, maybe you want to make sure your basement's dry. <laughs> but, you know, that might also be a good idea, too. Uh, but also be sure to set a date when you want to open it. And, you know, maybe write that down when you seal it up. No peeking. And uh, it's best to, you know, just then forget about it until that fateful day when it does get reopened. Maybe you might remember when you want to reopen it, or maybe you might completely forget about it and reopen it 10 years later. That's okay, too. So the whole point, everyone here, is just be creative and have fun with it. There is no right or wrong way. Whatever you come up with will be a very unique treasure that you are sure to enjoy in the future. So my friends, that concludes our program, Golden Record Messages from Earth. If you do make a time capsule at home, be sure to take a picture of it and tag us on social media. We would love to know what you put in yours. Uh, and I'd also like to thank you now, everyone, so much for watching and sharing your questions and comments with me today. Uh, if you have any other questions about our programs, feel free to reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. Also, be sure to follow and subscribe to this channel for our upcoming programs. And if you enjoyed this or any of our past programs, we would love your feedback, too. There's a link in the chat that I encourage you to click on to answer a few questions that will help us to plan future sessions. Uh, looking ahead, everyone, now that school is starting back up again, I want to give you a heads up that we are going to be reducing these streaming Intrepid Adventures programs to just Thursdays at 3 p.m. in the coming months, so just once a week. But we hopefully we'll see you all still here on Thursdays. Uh, so our next family program is going to be Journey to Space. We are going to talk a little bit more about Intrepid's connection to space and the space race. Uh, also about a few of the missions that helped us to get to the moon and also why it is so very important to wear your spacesuit. Once again, that is coming up next week. 
on Thursday at 3 p.m. Also, a reminder that our museum is back open to the public seven days a week from 10 to 5 p.m. So if you happen to be in the area, come on by and say hello. And lastly, I would love to plug one more really exciting program that we've got coming up in two weeks on Tuesday, September 14th. The Intrepid Museum is once again partnering with Atlas Obscura's online experiences for a very, very super rare look inside of one of our most wonderful collections pieces right behind me here. Uh, of course, the Space Shuttle Enterprise. So you will get to hear from Intrepid Museum's curator of aviation, Eric Bain, as well as we've got a special guest on this time. It's going to be NASA astronaut Mario Runco Jr., who's going to share some firsthand stories about life was like in a space shuttle. If you're interested in uh, checking this out and again, seeing inside of this wonderful, wonderful creation here, please do visit intrepidmuseum.org to uh, sign up for that, or you can also visit atlasobscura.com slash experiences. So tune in, find out more about how you can sign up for this very, very exciting program coming up. Once again, that's going to be Tuesday, uh, September 14th. All right, my friends. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you next week for our upcoming programs or another program in the future. See you then, everyone. <laughs>